There are many important physical situations in which you're given an entire infinite collection of vectors at each point in a region in the XY plane, in space, uh, in theory, in any number of dimensions. But really for us, we'll care mainly about in R2 and in R3 and two and three dimensions. Um, and these are called vector fields. Uh, in you know, a vector field, I'm going to write the definition, but a vector field mathematically is just uh, a function on a region in Rn that assigns a vector in Rn to each point in the region. Um, why you would care about such a thing, the easiest way to explain that is to give an example that everyone should be at least vaguely familiar with. So, um, ah, so yes, this is vector fields. Um, so, suppose you've got, you're, you're at a point in space, say x naught, y naught, z naught, and you have a point mass there, so a mass point mass of mass M, capital M. So a point mass, we mean it has, it's ideally just zero dimensional. Of course, that doesn't exist in real life. If it's um, spherical or a ball, really completely symmetric, uh, you could just use the center of mass. But we'll just go with the idealized point mass. Well, then if you put a mass point mass of some other mass, little m, at various points in space, then you should know that Newton's universal law of gravitation tells you that, oh, um, there's gravitational force between big M and little m, and if we think of big M as acting on little m, um, the gravitational force on little m from big M points straight towards big M and its magnitude is given by, well, I'll write it, but the universal gravitational constant times big M times little m divided by the distance squared. So um, Newton's, Newton's law of universal gravitation tells us that the force, so the force exerted by big M on little m has magnitude probably should know this. It's given by the universal gravitational constant. Um, we don't really care what its value is in this example. So universal gravitational constant. And then, well, let me get this out of the way. And then big M and little m, and then uh, the distance squared, I may have said the distance a minute ago, the distance squared between the two objects. So I'm going to write, I'm going to let, if the big mass is at x naught, y naught, z naught, and the little mass is at x, y, z, then I'm going to, this displacement vector is x naught, y naught, z naught minus x, y, z. So it's the vector x naught minus x, y naught minus y, z naught minus z. And then the distance between them is the magnitude of the displacement vector. And then it's squared. So that's the, the magnitude of the force. But the force vector, well, that's its magnitude, and its direction is this way, which is a unit vector in that direction is d divided by, or the unit vector in that direction, is d divided by the magnitude of d. And so this is the force. 
the force exerted in point. This is a scalar times this vector, so you can write this as gmm over the magnitude of d cubed times d. And the point is, in this quick example, is that, yeah, so universal gravitation, if you fix the point m, or sorry, fix the point x naught, y naught, z naught, fix the point mass, capital M, and think about moving a little point mass, little m, around, then at each point in space, you get a force vector. Well, this is an example of a vector field. Now, I say at each point, that's not quite true. If you put little m right on top of big M, so this is zero, you'd be um, dividing by zero, that would be bad. So, yeah, this, is, this gives us a force vector at each point in space other than at x naught, y naught, z naught. So, this is a kind of a primary example of a force field. So, this is a, a vector field, and this one represents force, which is one of our primary examples. Vector field. This one's a, this one's a force field. So what, as I said when I was introducing it, what's a vector field? Well, mathematically, it's easy to define. And the definition, if u is a subset of Rn, a vector field, and some people would say an n-dimensional vector field. A vector field on u is just a function. Which, you know, one of our favorite names is f because we're thinking of force fields, but it doesn't matter what you call it. It's just a function from u back into Rn which you think of as assigning it to each point in U, it gives you a vector in Rn. Um, but it, it's, it's important that you realize f of p, at each point, the vector field is considered as a vector based at p. Remember we talk, we've talked about base vectors before for velocity vectors, tangent vectors. There's a point that you should think of them emanating from and vector fields are the same way f, f of p is considered as a vector based at p. It would be strange to think of it as being based anyplace else. You know, in theory, you can move vectors around. They don't know where they start and where they stop. But f of p, you draw it based at p, um, and it's how you should think of it. It's considered as a vector based at p. All right, um, that's, that's all a vector field is, but um, you know, typically we wouldn't just want an arbitrary function. We'd want it to at least be continuous or maybe C1, so continuously differentiable. Um, we're not just going to look at arbitrary functions. So um, let's look at, let's look at this example, but put in some x, y's and z's. Um, so, you know, as an example, let's look at the force field, the force field that you get from Newton's law of universal gravitation, but I'm going to Suppose we pick conveniently, suppose g times big M times little m, that we're using units and values for capital M and little m so that this is one. Um, I'm just doing this to make an easy example. Suppose and big M is at 1, 1, 1. Well, what we had a minute ago is that the, ve the vector field, the force field, was we had GMM over 
the magnitude of the displacement cubed times the displacement vector. We're, we're cheating and assuming that g times m times m is 1, so that makes this easy. So we get 1. And then our displacement vector, d, is 1, 1, 1 minus x, y, z. So that's 1 minus x, 1 minus y, 1 minus z. And so the vector field that we're talking about is, I need to take the magnitude of that and cube it. So that's, I get 1 minus x squared plus 1 minus y squared plus 1 minus z squared. I should take the square root of that to get the magnitude, then cube it. So that's to the 3 halves. And then that's all multiplied times, yeah, I think it's going to fit there. Um, that's all multiplied times the dis displacement vector, so it almost is in the right spot. This is, it's easiest to write the displacement vector divided by that. So this is the law of universal gravitation. It's just a way, I mean, one way you could think about this vector field. Um, it gives you a for each x, y, and z, unequal to one, the single point, 1, 1, 1, you've got a vector at each point, which represents the force that the big mass m is exerting on um, a little mass m at the point x, y, z. So there's a vector field. It's defined on a region in R3, and that region is all of R3 minus the single point, 1, 1, 1. Um, <clears throat> how else might you get a vector field, well, we like force fields. They're uh, an important reason, one of the main reasons we look at vector fields. But velocity vector fields are also um, of interest. Um, you might be dealing with a flowing fluid, so a velocity vector field. So then you might be, you know, we'll write little v, but we could keep calling it f. Doesn't mean, I mean, just because it's a velocity vector field doesn't mean we can't denote it by an f. But you know, when we try to use f for force and v for velocity, but sometimes you mix the two. A velocity vector field, it you know, might specify the velocity. of a flowing, this is just an example, of a flowing stream or river, of a flowing stream, right? Roughly, if the, the volume of water that's flowing per time unit um, isn't changing too much, and you, you would expect the velocity at each point in a stream or in a riverbed to roughly just depend on the point that it would... Um, that, yeah, as stuff flows along still at this point in space, um, the velocity is the same as long as the amount of water flowing by, the rate at which water is flowing by remains the same because it's determined by the shape of the riverbed or streambed. Um, I'm going to think of a velocity vector field, but, and of course fluids flowing are three-dimensional, but let's look at a two-dimensional vector field. I'd like to look at um, let's look at the vector field on R2 that's given by minus y x. I'm going to think of this in a minute as kind of fluid flowing, and then you'll see what it looks like for flowing fluid, and maybe you can decide for yourself whether it's reasonable or not for this to be the velocity vector field of or at least the top view of the velocity of a flowing fluid. How do you sketch vector fields by hand? Well, first of all, you can't sketch them very well. Too many vectors in the vector field by hand because it takes a long time. Um, computers can do it fairly well, which is how the graphics in the book were generated. But you can do a few by hand and get an idea, and then you can analyze the situation kind of more analytically. So, Let's try to get an idea of what this vector field looks like. 
So <clears throat> here's x, here's y. Let's look at the velocity vector field, or this vector field, whether it's velocity or not. What is it at the point 1, 0? Well, that means you're putting in x is 1 and y is 0, which means over here you get 0, 1. Um, so that means at the point 1, 0, we draw the vector 0, 1. So if here we are at 1, 0, so this is the point 1, 0, but now you draw the vector 0, 1 starting at this point. So that would mean you would go change 0 in the x direction and go up 1 in the y direction. So you get that vector. OK. What do you get at, we could look at 1, 1. We'll get minus 1, 1. So what are we getting at 1, 1? So that should be where, that should be where this ends. We should get, all right, we go minus 1 in the x direction and then 1 in the y direction. So, so we would get that vector. What about, um, so minus 1 in the x direction, up 1 in the y direction. What about at x is 0 and y is 1. Well, then you put in x is 0 and y is 1, you get, oops, you get minus 1, 0. So at this point, you get something that goes this way. Uh, you can keep checking at, at this point. So at minus 1, 0, when x is minus 1 and y is 0, you get 0 minus 1, so you get this. And over here at, at, minus, at 0 minus 1, you get this. And if you keep checking, what you see is that the vectors, or if you have a computer draw it, the vectors seem to kind of point around in circles, roughly, and they get bigger as you move away from the origin. Um, so that if I'm trying to draw a bunch more, Vectors kind of um, move around in circular patterns, but they should get bigger, which I'm not drawing. If you try to draw vector fields accurately, part of the problem you encounter is the vector field, the vectors cross each other. So frequently we scale the size of the vectors and don't really draw exactly what's happening. But you should see the vectors kind of spiral around. And if you look in the book, you'll just see an incredible number of them. In fact, you can see. You can check that things are kind of moving in circles or the pointing around in circles because what's going on, and you can't always do what I'm about to do, you can analyze this vector field kind of nicely in a couple of ways. So we're looking at the vector field v of x, y equals minus y, x. Well, the magnitude of this is the square root of, so it's the magnitude of this, so it's the square root of this squared plus this squared. So it's the square root of x squared plus y squared, which is the same as the magnitude of x, y. So the length of the vector you know, that I'm drawing, which is supposed to represent the magnitude, um, the length I'm supposed to draw is the same as the distance from the origin. So that's why as you get closer to the origin, uh, your arrow should get smaller and should approach zero. And as you get farther away, your arrow should get bigger. But it's also true that if you take the dot product of v of x, y with x, y, well, then you get minus y comma x dotted with xy, so you get minus xy plus xy, you get zero. Which means that our vector field is always perpendicular to the vector from the origin out to the point xy. Well, yeah, that's why things are, when I said that things are pointing around in circles, 
it's yeah, if you're at this point, if you're at this point, then you need to draw a vector that has that length, but is perpendicular to this one, and as we saw, they're pointing counterclockwise. So, you know, you draw one that's the same magnitude and perpendicular to this one, and that, that together with kind of pointing counterclockwise completely determines how you draw this vector field at each point. You draw a vector the same length, but perpendicular, So, um, right, so that's why our vector field looks like it does. If you're at this point, you could draw that, for instance. But you can't do this with most vector fields. You can't see some nice relationship. Oh, that's perpendicular to this line, and it's, um, but this one's fairly nice. But in general, it's, <laughs> it's hard to draw sketch a vector field well by hand because you have to sketch a whole bunch of vectors to get an idea of what it looks like. Um, thinking of this as a velocity vector field, I mean, it's a vector field. Um, it might be reasonable to interpret it as velocity, but maybe not. If, if you're thinking of it as velocity, you might think, oh, it's, uh, things are swirling around. Um, but the velocity, you might think, oh, it is fluid and it's going down a hole at, at the origin. Well then, if things were spiraling around a hole, you might expect that the velocity would pick up, get you know, the speed would be faster near the origin as it speeds up to swirl down the hole. Maybe not. But if you think that, then this wouldn't be reasonable because understand the speed, the magnitude of this vector field is getting smaller as you approach the origin. On the other hand, if you thought about it as a top view of a spinning disc, like a record or a CD or a DVD, a top view of a, a spinning disc, then yeah, the outer points would spin at a greater speed than the inner points, and the origin itself wouldn't change at all. So yeah, you could interpret this as a velocity vector. Just think of this as, oh yeah, at each point, I'm thinking about a record or <laughs> some disc rotating around and you're keeping track of the velocity vectors at each point in an underlying coordinate frame. So you've got an underlying coordinate system, the one that's sitting there like on the turntable or whatever is making the, the disk spin and you're indicating the velocity at each point. Um, if it's really a velocity vector field, you could ask if something flows along with that velocity and you know where it starts, where will it end? So this is a, if this were really indicating that how something was flowing, then, you know, the velocity vectors, and you think, oh, if you start there, you kind of follow this arrow a little bit and go kind of over here, and then you'd start following this arrow, and then you'd follow this arrow, right? You're a, a flow of a vector field, is a flow is you start at a point and you're interpreting the vector field as a velocity vector field. Even if physically it's not a velocity vector field, if you're talking about a flow of the vector field, you should think of it as a velocity vector field. Because what you're doing is you're, a flow of the vector field is a parameterized path, which you think of as the position of an object at time t, an object that starts at some point and it moves in such a way that its velocity vectors are always given by the vector field at any point that it's at. So what does that mean? So a flow of a vector field And I'll call it F just because it's kind of our default name for a vector field, but you really want to think of a velocity vector field, um, is a parameterized path, or a function, I'll just say a function, P from, this is a closed interval, so maybe I'll write T naught to T1 some closed interval which you think of as time into your region. So 
I'm still dealing with F is a vector field on U. Um, and this is supposed to be where a particle would be at time t, so at which points in U, if this is describing how the particle moves inside the vector field. So what is it that we want? It's such that we want the velocity vector of the object, of the particle, well that's dp dt, to be given precisely by our vector field at the point. So you want dp dt to be the vector field evaluated at p of t. What this says is the vector field at each point p of t is giving you the velocity vector of this parameterized path. So you think a particle that's moving um, with velocity vectors given by the vector field. All right. Okay. Well, finding these, these flows, so this is a definition of flow of a vector field. Um, finding these flows can be difficult because it's typically solving some differential equations. But it's not hard to check that something something's a flow. And sketching them is, is a, it's like a connecting the dot problem, and it also depends on how many vectors you've got in the vector field. You start at a point, and you see which way the vector field is pointing, and you start drawing a curve that goes in that direction, and you want every, every point that the curve passes through, the vector in the vector field that starts at that point should be tangent to the curve you're drawing, and you should be heading in that direction. So it's a connecting the dot problem, and you need a lot of arrows to do it well, and I didn't draw very many. But you start here, and you kind of follow the arrows around, and you connect the dots, always following the arrows, um, so that the arrows end up tangent to your curve. And if you're in between arrows, you try to approximate, well, which way would an arrow point if it were in that missing space? And you just kind of follow the arrows around. So what we'd like to see, for instance, is that for this, the vector field that we had a minute ago, that um, uh, circles are flows, circles centered at the origin are flows of the vector field. So, so if things are working right, so here's another example. So we'll let this be our vector field on R2. Let's show that p of t equals r cosine of t sine of t. So our favorite parameterization of a circle, and here's one of radius r, where this is constant, show that this is a flow of v. So what does that mean we need to show? We need to show, so the whole question is, is it true that for that p, dp dt equals v of p of t? Well, you just calculate this and this. Um, the derivative of p of t is r times minus the, cos, uh, minus the sine of t, cosine of t. And the question is, does that equal, all right, v of p of t. v says you exchange the x and y coordinates and you negate the first one. So if you wrote this as r cosine of t, r sine of t, you swap these two and negate that one. So you get minus r sine of t, r cosine of t. Are these the same? Sure they are. Just factor out the r over here. Put that one in. Minus sine of t, cosine of t. So yeah. Yeah, this parameterized circle of radius r is a flow of our vector field. It's no surprise. I kept talking about it. Flo moving, flowing in circles. So, all right. Um, what else do we need to look at? Um, in terms of vector fields, and where else do you get vector fields? Well, there's another easy way to get a vector field. So, yeah, we like 
force fields. Those are nice. They come up lots of ways. Velocity vector fields. Those are nice. They're also gradient vector fields. So you can just take a function. So suppose f is a function on a region u. And we can assume either f is differentiable or continuously differentiable. I want its partial derivatives to exist. So um, assume one of those two things, differentiable or continuously differentiable, or just that the partials exist even. Then the vector field given by the gradient vector of f at each point is called the gradient vector field. Thought it, we've talked about the gradient vector for a long time, and we think of it as a vector at a point. This is just a, a mild change in perspective where you realize, oh, it gives you a whole collection of vectors at oh, an infinite number of points. So um, an easy example, or an example, they're all, they're all kind of the same. So an example uh, let f equal x cubed minus 5xy squared plus 2y to the fourth. What's the gradient vector field of this? Well, f. You don't have to call it f at all. You just write the gradient of f. It's the partial derivative with respect to x, so 3x squared minus 5y squared, comma, the partial derivatives with respect to y, so minus 10xy plus 8y cubed. Um, so, yeah, it's a gradient vector field. The point is that before we were kind of looking at this point-wise and thinking of, oh, at a point, this is what you get. Maybe we looked at special points, but um, now we take, kind of a, we think about it all at once, like at each point, x and y and r2, this gives you a vector field. Um, I should say something about, something important about a gradient vector field. What you don't want to do, so let me put, don't confuse a flow with a level curve. So they're, they're almost exactly opposites of each other. In a sense, they are. So for instance, if you have a computer graph where f equals 1, the level curve where f equals 1, it looks roughly like roughly like this. So this is the level curve where f is 1. Remember, though, so a flow, a flow of the vector field, that cur if, if that were a flow, the, every point that it passes through, the vector field would be tangent to this curve. But you need to remember, and we've known this for a long time now, <laughs> level curves are perpendicular to the gradient vectors. So the gradient vectors here don't, don't do anything like, don't do anything like the gradient vector field doesn't point along here. It's perpendicular to here. Uh, I don't think I made a note about whether it's, ah, whether it's up or down. So um, I suppose we could check. Let's, I, I'm, I'm trying to decide whether I want to draw a bunch of perpendicular vectors that do this or a bunch of perpendicular vectors that do this. So let's just, uh, Let's check a point. 
and see what we get. I, uh, when x is 1 and y is 0, you would be on the curve. So let's look at when x, y is 1, 0. So then f of, my point is f of 1, 0 is 1. So 1, 0 is a point on the level curve, so it should be this one. <clears throat> um, does our, does the gradient vector point that way or that way? It's when x is 1 and y is 0, we are getting the gradient vector of f at 1, 0. Is x is 1 and y is 0, this is 0, this is 3. So we're getting a vector here that points like that. Um, that doesn't prove it, but it lets me know that, oh, yeah, so we're getting the, the gradient vector field. I'm not trying to draw the magnitudes correctly. But the gradient vector field is pointing perpendicular to this and just <clears throat> outward. So a level curve, a level curve, for a gradient vector field, a level curve and a flow are almost exactly opposites, in a sense. In a flow, the, the vector field should be tangent to the curve, but level curves would be perpendicular to the vector field, to the gradient field. <clears throat> okay. Um, another important concept is, what well, one is just a slight change in perspective of this. It's, this is, you've got a function, you produce a vector field. What if you've got a vector field and you just want to say, oh, there exists a function so that that vector field is a gradient vector field of that function. Well, you could still call capital F a gradient vector field, but the term that's usually used is conservative vector field, and these will be very important to us in a couple of sections. Um, so F is a, this is just a definition, but it's an important one. A conservative vector field F is a conservative vector field if and only if well it's the gradient vector field of some F so if and only if there exists an F such that capital F is the gradient vector field of little f. So as I've said, we're going to, well, there's a whole section just on conservative vector fields and we're going to look at that um, later. All right, other important basic notions for vector fields that will be important to us later are something called the divergence and the curl of a vector field. Um, I want to go ahead and define those now, but before I do that, we have to think of gradient, this gradient symbol, in a special way that's very helpful. So <clears throat> I need to spend some time on the gradient operator. And it's just, it exists in Rn, and it's just, you think of it, it's just this vector of instructions to take partial derivatives. So we call it an operator when it's something that you do to a function, and it gives you a function back. So that this is the gradient operator, and you just think of it as the vector of partial derivatives. And then you think that multiplication means apply the operator, so take partial derivatives. So for that reason, you know, it works, it's nice with this gradient vector notation, gradient vector field, because you think of this as multiplication, so you think, oh, I multiply, it looks like multiplication, but you should really think of it as applying the operator. So it means you apply this operator to that, which means exactly that you take all the partial derivatives. Well, good. That's 
that's what the gradient vector is. So that notation is nice for that. Why are we introducing this gradient operator? Well, because we might have a vector field, a vector field, kind of one of the most important examples for us is in three dimensions, a vector field, and it's given by, you know, so a vector field on a region in R3, you give back vectors in R3, so that means you have to have three functions, which we frequently call P, Q, and R. And then the question is, well, what should you mean by the gradient operator dotted with this vector field? All right, well, what should the gradient operator dotted with the vector field mean? So, well, when you just have three variables, we don't use x sub 1 through x sub n, we just use x, y, and z. So the gradient operator you should think of as partial with respect to x, comma, the partial with respect to y, comma, the partial with respect to z. Okay, so what does it mean to dot with that? Well, so we've got this gradient operator vector, this gradient, this vector of partial derivatives dotted with, well, I'm going to suppress the of x, y, z every place, dotted with pqr. Well, what does dot product mean? It means you multiply the corresponding entries and then you add. But anytime you multiply by the partial with respect to x, you think you apply the operator. So you take the partial derivative. And when you multiply by the partial with respect to y, you take the partial derivative. And when you multiply times partial with respect to z, you take the partial derivative. So this, is, this notation would just mean, oh, you take the partial derivative of p with respect to x, you add to that the partial derivative of q with respect to y, and you add to that the partial derivative of r with respect to z. This is actually an important operation. It may seem a little weird, but it means you take the x component, kind of the component in the first, the first component function, the one that's in the x position, and you take its partial with respect to x, you take the partial of this with respect to y, and the partial of that with respect to z. This is a scalar function, and it turns out to be very important. This is called the divergence of f. And it's this dot product. Um, a lot of people just write div f. And it's computed exactly like this. You take the partial derivatives of each component function with respect to the kind of variable that corresponds to that place. Um, why this is important, we will see later. But right now, we can certainly calculate an example of divergence. So, example. Let f equal 3x squared yz plus y e to the sine of z, comma, 5xy cubed minus x inverse tangent of z, comma, minus 7yz plus x squared y to the fourth. It looks bad, but it's easy to calculate the divergence. You take the partial derivative of this part with respect to x. Well, then this doesn't matter. This doesn't depend on x. So you get 6xyz. You take the partial derivative of this part with respect to y. So this part doesn't matter. So you get plus 15xy squared. Then you take the partial derivative of this part with respect to z. So this part doesn't matter. And you just get plus a negative 7y. And that's it. That's the divergence of that vector field. Why on earth you would care about that is something else entirely, but calculating the divergence is certainly not challenging. 
the curl is worse. So the curl of a vector field, you only do this in R3. Well, you can do it in R2, kind of. We'll talk about that. But we want the curl of F. And this is written as the gradient operator crossed with F. So this is the cross product. We only do this in, in R3. So <clears throat> how bad is this? Well, <laughs> it's not so good. It's not so bad. It's, so the curl of F, is the gradient operator crossed with F, and if you write F out in its component functions, P, Q, and R, that's not an E, that's an underlined F, you, you use the determinant, and you take I, J, and K, you put the, the gradient operator here, And you put P, Q, and R here, and you just take cross product as you would before, as you did before, but every time one of those partial derivatives is multiplied times a function, you really take the partial derivative. So what do you get? You should not memorize the answer. You should remember that you do this cross product each time and do that. You should not memorize what I'm about to write. It's the I component is you think this times this minus this times this, but all those times meant take the partial derivative. So it is the partial of derivative of r with respect to y minus the partial derivative of q with respect to z times i. And the sign alternates to a minus. And you get this times this minus this times this. But again, times means apply the partial derivative. So you get this times j. And then the sign alternates back to a plus, and you get this times this minus this times this. But that means the partial of q with respect to x minus the partial of p with respect to y times k. And that's the curl of a vector field in R3. Do not memorize this. Always do the cross product. It's too easy to make mistakes when you try to memorize this. Um, before I do an example of this, I want to say something else, which is what two-dimensional curl means. So suppose you've got a vector field, maybe I'll call it something else like G, and it's just in R2. So you've got some P of XY and some Q of XY. Well, you can consider this as a vector in, in R, a vector field in R3 if you want by considering the vector field, I suppose I'll call this H, by considering the vector field X, Y, Z. And what is it? It's just P of X, Y, Q of X, Y, zero. So you don't actually use the Z anywhere. You don't actually use the z anywhere, and you always make this third component zero. So this is how you kind of take a vector field in R2 and view it as one in R3. It, um, so what do you get if you take the curl of this vector field? Well, the, so this is p, this is q, r is zero. So if you take the curl of this, the r is zero, so this part's zero. None of the functions depend on z, so the partial derivative of p and q with respect to z, that's zero. So the i term drops out. Um, r is zero, so this is zero. The uh, p doesn't depend on z, so this is zero. So this part's zero. But you get this. So what you get for the, the curl of this h vector field is the partial of q with respect to x, which I'll write as q sub x, minus the partial of p with respect to y times k. So there's just this one scalar that you care about that's multiplied times k, but it's just one scalar. For that reason, for a two-dimensional vector field, 
the two-dimensional curl, so the, the two-dimensional curl, of the vector field p of x, y, q of x, y is just the scalar that's out in front. So it's not exactly the curl of this vector field because you leave off the k, right? Understand, the curl in general is a vector field. Curl of a vector field is a vector field. The divergence of a vector field is a scalar function. Curl of a vector field is a vector field, but when you talk about two-dimensional curl, you mean, you don't mean a vector field, so it's a little, little confusing, but try to keep it straight. Um, there are two last things that I want to say, and they are straightforward calculations. Uh, I won't verify them, but you just do the calculations, and you see that they're true, and these will be important to us later. So, you can take, you start with a function f, and you take its gradient vector field. So then you've got a vector field, and you can take its curl. Well, it turns out gradient vector fields have no curl. In other words, this is always the zero vector field. If you do the calculation, everything cancels out. You'll need for f to be c2 here, continuously twice differentiable. Um, but aside from that, um, I mean, assuming that's true, the curl will be zero. We need to be able to take, this makes you take one partial derivative, curl makes you take another one, and then you want mixed partials to be the same. And then the other thing that's true is the divergence of the curl of a vector field, as long as you can do these things. So again, you need the curl here, you'll need for this vector field to be, well, you need for the partial derivatives to exist, but we want C1, and then you need um, you need to take more derivatives for the divergence. So again, you want C2 for the component functions of f. The divergence of the curl is always zero. Not the zero vector. Divergence is a scalar function. How do you show those things? You just calculate them from the definitions of the divergence um, from the gradient vector, um, the curl, and the divergence, um, the divergence of a vector field. Uh, it's, they're not hard to do. Uh, you should do them as an exercise. But these will be important to us later, that gradient vector fields have no curl, and curls of vector fields have no divergence. We will look at all these, all of these things will be important to us in later sections.